As a follow-up to our uh, discussion last Tuesday about utopia and dystopia, I'd like to read a section from a paper of mine that was published in the academic journal Futures about five years ago. And the title is uh, The Dialectic of U Utopian Images of the Future Within the Idea of Progress. So uh, as I read this, uh, this, the opening section, the introduction, and as I read it, you should uh, listen, take notes, uh, write down any comments or questions that you might have. I will uh, uh, put this on e-class later to, that you can read over. Because, you know, I want to discuss uh, the, at least this section of the paper. In Frederick Pollock's foundational contribution to future studies, he posits a social critique and systematic reconstruction as the fundamental criterion of a utopist whose utopia serves as a buffer for the future, as a driving force toward the future, and as a trigger for social progress. The utopist is an eternal questioner, writes Pollock, the prototype of the revolutionary and radical spirit whose task is to hold up two mirrors, one to reflect the contemporary generation and one to reflect a counter image of a possible future. Pollock's characterization of a utopist is strikingly similar to that of Karl Mannheim, who writes that only those orientations transcending reality will be referred to us as utopian, which, when they pass over into conduct, tend to shatter, either partially or wholly, the order of things prevailing at the time. The reconceptualization of a utopist as a radical or revolutionary who acts to sh shatter present reality and then reconstructs it according to his or her vision of the future is justified in order to distinguish between the passive, thus harmless to the status quo, otherworldly dreamer, and the proactive thinker who does not merely engage in idle philosophical speculations about the future or science fiction, but also acts into this world as a catalyst to realize a better future. As Mannheim relates, though an ideological state of mind be incongruent with reality, it is not yet utopus. One can only be utopist when one actualizes the utopia and proactively works to burst the bonds of the existing order. Within Pollock's two mirrors of the revolutionary utopist, the one reflecting the contemporary generation represents the function of social critique since it involves self-reflection as a trigger for social evolution through the unpacking of the fundamental assumptions and values underlying the belief system that forms and permeates the structure of a particular society or civilization. In other words, by exposing implicit assumptions in the idealist structures of a paradigm, one obtains objective social consciousness, which leads to foresight concerning social evolution, development, activism, and at times revolution. The assumption is that when armed with such consciousness, the image of the future is clarified. Consequently, the door is open for reconstruction, the function of the other mirror in the realization of alternative futures as venues for social change. However, Pollock and Manham's recasting of the utopists as a radical revolutionary is problematic, to say the least. As pointed out by Popper, Karl Popper, the radical uh, utopist pursues ideologically fixed utopian ends and often justifies and advocates violent means to achieve such ends. It is the uncompromising radicalism prepared to make a wholesale sweeping changes to wipe the slate clean in order to construct or realize its ultimate political aim or ideal society that Popper objects to and regards as dangerous. Its historicism and asceticism jettisons reason 
and replaces it with a desperate hope for political miracles in order to realize the utopist dreams of a beautiful world, springing from an intoxication that is essentially romanticist at heart, appealing to our emotions rather than reason. Also, the implementation of the utopian blueprint usually leads to a centralization of power, rule by the few or dictator, and since the ultimate aim is uncompromising and has abandoned reason, differences of opinions among utopists often, often leads, in the absence of rational methods, to the use of power instead of reason, that is, to violence. Popper notes a number of problems related to utopian engineering, which he says is nothing more than the application of the experimental method to society for the sake of social reconstruction as a whole, based on a blueprint of the ultimate aim. And for the success of this social experiment, countless sacrifices are made and powerful interests get involved. However, since this large-scale social reconstruction effort necessarily takes place over long periods of time, ideas and ideals change, so the successors of the grand project may not view the blueprint the same way as those who originally conceived it, especially as the experiment meets certain social challenges during implementation, the ultimate aim begins to change during the process of its realization. It may at, at any moment turn out that the steps so far taken actually lead away from the realization of the new aim. And if we change our direction according to the new aim, then we expose ourselves to the same risk again. In spite of all the sacrifices made, we may never get anywhere at all. Because the experimental method involved in utopian engineering has no experience to base itself upon, the practical consequences of such sweeping changes are difficult to predict and often lead to social catastrophe. Hence, states Popper, it is not reasonable to assume that a complete reconstruction of our social world would lead at once to a workable system. What Popper advocates instead is what he calls piecemeal engineering, in which a blueprint of society and ideal state does not necessarily play a significant role in the pursuit of happiness and perfection on earth. In fact, rather than focusing on achieving the greatest good, the piecemeal engineer will instead adopt the method of searching for and fighting against the greatest and most urgent evils of society. As Popper relates, it's easier to reach a reasonable agreement about existing evils and the means of combating them than it is about an ideal good and the means of its realization. Also, rather than large-scale reconstruction efforts involving the whole of society, piecemeal social experiments are carried out incrementally, on a small scale, under realistic conditions, which permits for repeated experiments and continual readjustments. Even if we consider the possibility of wholesale reconstruction efforts, they can only work where the piecemeal method has furnished us first with a great number of detailed experiences and, and even then only within the realm of those experiences. For the experiment we learn most from is one that proceeds rationally with the alter, alteration of one social institution at a time. Only in this way can we learn how to fit institutions into the framework of other institutions and how to adjust them so that they work according to our intentions. And only in this way can we make mistakes and learn from our mistakes without risking repercussions of a gravity that must endanger the will to future reforms. Popper's piecemeal engineering, a method distinguished by reason, pragmatism, incrementalism, and compromise has been the prevailing approach to purposeful social change in modern society, while revolutionary utopian efforts at wholesale social reconstruction do not have a very good track record, a checkered history at best. Accordingly, it must be granted that Popper's criticism of utopian engineering accurately points out the defects of the radical approach to social change that Pollock and Mannheim seem to advocate. On the other hand, Popper's piecemeal approach, which he paints in glowing terms as defects that Popper completely ignores, 
Moreover, Popper's analysis does not appreciate the historical role of the utopist revolutionary and the utopian image of the future, which can inspire and guide a society and civilization within its, with its holistic vision and systematic approach to social change. If we investigate Popper's piecemeal approach closely, its defects become apparent. But one thing, the piecemeal approach does not provide an overall understanding of the structure or systemic nature of the society in question. Thus, even though independent improvements are made because of certain inherent contradictions and systemic defects in the structure as a whole, the society or civilization in question could be unraveling and disintegrating from within, especially if the civilization is based on a runaway capitalism on the path of overshoot and collapse. In this scenario, due to its ignorance of fundamental contradictions eating away at the core of society, the piecemeal approach is blind and useless. Because the piecemeal approach denies the interconnected nature of society and is short-sighted, it lacks a coherent, holistic vision of the future. And as Pollock points out, civilizations that lack an image of the future are not able to adequately meet the challenges of the future and thus die out. A coherent, holistic image of the future, based on an understanding of the overall structure of society, is better able to remedy structural defects and employ foresight to help meet the challenges of the future. Popper's piecemeal approach can be likened to free market ideology, the belief in a mythical invisible hand, which is invisible because it doesn't exist, at least not in relation to the overall development or evolution of society. In other words, it may or may not exist, uh, in relation to the market itself, but if the market is impervious to its overall effects on society or the societal uh, or the environment, then the invisible hand could in fact lead to social dis disintegration and civilizational collapse. Certain piecemeal societal improvements willy-nilly are incapable of preventing the collapse of civilization due to inherent contradictions and systemic defects. Now, though Popper rightly points out the dangers of utopian engineering and radical restructuring of society, his piecemeal approach by itself is an unsatisfactory solution. Thus, although one should certainly be aware of the dangers of utopian engineering, which one should not also throw the baby out with the bathwater by disavowing the role of utopian images of the future in civilizational evolution. Popper's piecemeal approach is a progressive view, very much in line with the idea of progress. However, because this idea of progress is divorced from utopian images of the future, it's not sustainable. Piecemeal engineering is an evolutionary approach that betrays an ignorance of the, of the overall design and direction of society. On the other hand, while the utopian view is revolutionary and can be radical, it does exhibit an understanding of structural and systemic defects of society, which it attempts to address through fundamental social change towards a vision of the future. Yet, if it becomes too ideological and impatiently divorces itself from the evolutionary approach to social change, it can be dangerous, as Popper points out. My thesis is that both are necessary components of the dialectic of utopian images of the future within the idea of progress, which is at the same time evolutionary and revolutionary, is historical and can be used as a basis for a prognosis of the future of humanity.